Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Welcome to Live Wednesday Q&As with Darcy. I'm so happy to be here with you. The question on the top of the hour today is beyond meat. Is it good for you? Meat substitutes, should you be eating those? And um, this is a topic and a dear to my heart. It's a great question that I was so happy to, to get to talk about this week. And um, so welcome. Let's dive right in. If you are coming on live, please wave. Let me know where you are, where you're watching from. Um, if you're watching the replay, feel free to do hashtag replay. And um, as always, I love your comments, your questions, your beautiful presence, your beautiful body. I'm Darcy. I'm the creator of the Vibrant Woman Program. I'm one of the founding members of Certified Math method, health coaches and practitioners. That math method was a, is a paradigm shifting oh, system of health, of really looking at human health from a very natural perspective. We've gotten way um, off into the weeds in terms of our, our modern lifestyles, what our societies are, are doing. Um, it's, we don't have any health care. We have a sick care system. And we're just, we've gotten so far outside of what's natural, what works for our bodies, where our instincts are trying to take us, that we're really wrecking our health. We're doing this to ourselves. And I know that's hard to hear. Um, some of you are ready for it. Some of you are sending me these fabulous questions every week. Thank you for doing it. Things like, should I be eating meat? Um, and what's up with this, uh, this habit of elimination I've got? What about my muscle cramps? So much of what I teach goes back to nutrition and what we put into our bodies. What I'm going to invite you to do today and always, whether you just kind of cruise by to learn a bit from me on the edges or whether you are coming all the way into my one-on-one -on -one, um, private coaching practice to do the deep dive, what I'm always inviting you to do is to pay attention to the signals that your body is sending because sh your body is always doing its best. It is always trying to keep up and thrive in whatever environments we're giving it to do so. All right. So um, welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. And uh, that's just sort of a little background and the, um, the foundation of what I'm always out here trying to do, which is to teach you to listen to your body and to do what is as natural for it as possible. Now, granted, that's going to be different for each of us, and that's even a moving target for, for individuals, for all of us. We have to stay up to date with what our body is asking for, not because it's aging necessarily, because it's been here longer, but because the circumstances are always changing. Um, so it's really to be fully embodied and to, to really learn how to thrive. It really takes this slowing down, you know, of really paying attention to our bodies, of learning to take those pauses, the deep breaths, to feel what it is that we're feeling, what it is our bodies are doing, what it is they're asking for. And um, there's a real bliss and a joy and a beauty that's found there in those moments. And then also just in that ongoing relationship with your one beautiful human body. So if you've been around here very long at all, you know one of the things I'm most passionate about talking about the body is what to feed it. So that's our first question today, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So I got this question um, from, well, so I get it as always. What I try to do is distill this down into themes so that I can help as many people as possible and talk about these bigger topics. I've had this question from a couple of different angles over the last about a week. Um, and this is the basic idea. Are meat substitutes good for you? Um, so I want to talk about why we even have a question like that. I want to unravel just a little bit of our cultural programming and take a look at what that question really means. And then, yes, I'm going to answer the question about what's on that label and what I recommend and what I don't. All right. So buckle in. Okay. Are meat substitutes good for you? 
Um, where I have a problem with this, and I am going to keep looking at my notes because my notes help keep me um, on topic. This is something I could, there are several rabbit holes here I could definitely go down, and I want to respect your time and mine and, and get to the heart of the question as quickly and efficiently as possible. But let me also say this. If you are hearing things that inspire new questions or curiosities, that's absolutely what I'm here for. You can come hop into my DMs for a further conversation. We can set up a discovery call. We can see if you would be a good fit for my private coaching practice where we have um, the luxury of more time every week for several months together to really make sure that you are as well informed as absolutely possible about what you should be putting into your body. Okay, so let me just say that. Are meat substitutes good for you? Well, where I have a problem with this basically is the idea that meat needs to be substituted for. Typically, when we talk about substitutions, we talk about them in terms of food and all different contexts, like I have a nut allergy, so if a recipe calls for that thing that I know I can't have, I'm going to either need to leave it out or make a substitution, all right? Some of us will substitute things that we know don't work for us personally, or we substitute things that we feel, um, you know, just don't really belong in there. So all of my baking good recipes will substitute a whole food flour, like coconut flour or almond flour, for the traditionally processed and nutrient deficient and toxic wheat flours. Um, so for example, substitutions need to be made if we know we can't have something, but we still need to create, you know, the cake. So where I really hit a bump with this is why we're talking about meat substitutions to begin with. Not you as a person with this beautiful, brilliant question. Thank you for being here and thank you for your question. I think it's a wonderful question. I think it's an important thing to talk about because in our culture at large, we have some problematic thinking. Number one, our societies um, are not very good at looking at root causes. We're really addicted to attacking symptoms. We're really addicted to just attacking anyway. Look at the way we handle any problem is to just go to war with it. Um, we're not so we're not we're not such good problem solvers. We humans. <laughs> we modern humans in our modern world. So let's just stop and think for a minute. Why does meat need to be substituted for? So what that tells us is that we think it's bad and we think there's something important about it. Okay, so I just want to unravel this for a minute. And I want to address both of those pieces. We think meat is bad because of propaganda, plain and simple, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to eat meat. Some of us are opposed to eating meat morally, does not fit our values. Um, and to those people, I am not here to criticize, judge, or, or change your mind. If eating meat does not feel right to you, if it does not make your body feel good, then absolutely you should be doing what feels best to you you should always be following your instincts and listening to your body. But I do have um, some suggestions. For those of us who have been sort of convinced that meat is bad for us, number one, on the climate change issue, that's based on propaganda and misinformation. And I would like to help um, counteract that. I think we need to be well informed about what's what's really happening here. Number two, if you have been um, taught to believe that eating meat is bad for you, uh, for your own personal health of your body, or um, out of respect for the animals, for the other lives, and the, and the humaneness of our farming systems, then I also would like to be a little piece of the, um, the sort of counter-propaganda campaign here. Um, and I'm going to give you some resources to continue to inform yourself. So number one, eating um, humanely raised meat, pastured meat on small local farms from regenerative farms. Um, and if you don't already know much about the regenerative agriculture movement, this is your formal invitation to come on in and learn more about that. Um, reach out to me if you want some resources. I will name drop a couple of books and, and movies here in just a minute. Let me just try to get my thoughts going in a straight path today. I told you this was a lot. Um, so 
Number one, humanely raised meat from responsible, regenerative, agricultural um, land stewards is not bad for the environment. Um, it, in fact, it's the opposite. It is one of the most important ways to sequester the um, excess um, carbon out of the environment. I This is not necessarily my specialty. I'm not going to get all these words correct. I, this is not my specialty. But I have learned enough about it to understand um, that it's important for us as consumers, as food consumers, as women who are impacting the beliefs and food choices of our children and our families, often that will carry on um, into the next generation or two, that as a woman, it is really important that we teach our families where real food comes from, okay? And for millennia, human beings have been surviving and thriving on healthy animal meats. There are things in those meats that we cannot get from anywhere else. We need a, a complete sequence of amino acids. They're essential amino acids because they must come in through the diet. Um, the the wilder the meat, the more complete and healthy and um, nutrient dense it is and free of stress hormones and toxins and all of the other stuff that we're trying to get away from. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you don't want to eat meat, that's fine. And then I'm going to recommend that you don't substitute your meat either because I'm going to talk to you in a minute about what's on the labels and uh, Beyond Meat or whatever these brands are, these meat substitutes are fake foods, which means they're not real foods, which means they don't belong in your basket, your pantry, or your body. But here's the idea, is that meat eating is has been an essential part of human surviving and thriving for millennia. And it is only in modern times that we raise our animals in inhumane, toxic, unsanitary, um, terrible conditions that are bad for human health, planetary health, the whole thing. So we don't, but listen, listen, nothing is ever all or nothing. It's never just black or white. We can choose to eat meat and do it in a way that is humane. All right, we can choose to get the nutrient density out of those animal proteins in a way that honors their lives, the planet's health, and our own bodies. So it does not have to be an either or. Whenever someone is presenting you with an either or, that person is missing context or consciousness, All right? So you get to make these choices. You get to, like I did, Go and find local farmers who are part of the regenerative agriculture movement, who are not torturing animals on their watch, who are participating in um, ancient and beneficial land stewardship and, and animal stewardship practices um, that are important for, for agriculture, for our soil development, for, for the weather patterns, for the carbon sequestering, um, for forest for the life cycle of a, of the forests and the fields and nature, like this is a part of life on planet Earth, the way it evolved to be. So participating in eating animals is not the problem. Being a part of the food chain is not the problem. It's the way that we do it and the way that it's done with greed and profits as a top priority rather than respect and honor for our lives, the lives of the animals and the planet. All right, so I think I've laid that foundation. I think you can see I'm pretty passionate about that because this is gonna take us to the next part of, of answering this question, which is this layer about really, should you be eating something? Is it better to eat something that nature made, that God and mother nature conspired over millennia to create and make, that our human bodies evolved to eat in this context, this very natural context? Do you think that's a better choice or something that comes out of a plastic wrapper, out of a box, off of a truck, out of a laboratory, out of a factory where it was bioengineered. Um, I don't even have the words to finish describing that scenario. I think you can picture what we're talking about. Food doesn't come out of a factory in a laboratory. Food comes out of the earth. Okay, so I, I do have a problem with these meat substitutes. Number one, it tells us that we know there's something important in that meat. Yes, the full range of essential amino acids. Okay, so that's why we're even talking about substituting to begin with, because we know there's something important in there, and there is. 
mask. But then we're talking about substituting because we're, we're also brainwashed to believe there's something bad about it. Well, if you're buying your meat from a typical grocery store, um, then yes, there probably is something bad about it. Now, to be quite honest, I would rather you eat real meat from a regular grocery store than eat fake anything. Um, but I don't, again, it doesn't have to be either or. Factory farmed meat is bad. Um, it is. It's bad. It's bad for the planet. It's bad for your body. Those poor animals are tortured. They're in inhumane conditions. Um, their bodies are then full of stress hormones and toxins, not the good natural nutrition that you're trying to get. When you put that beef roast in your crock pot and you let the smell of it fill up your house, um, you're wanting that to nourish your body and the people you love. You're wanting that to have come from nature. So then that's what we have to do. And that's what I help a lot of my private clients do. Um, sometimes we have to do a little research. Luckily, the regenerative agricultural movement um, makes it a, a bit easier these days to get a hold of local farmers. Most communities do have farmers markets where we can hook up with folks who are um, raising humane pastured meat. And then we can participate in that local economy in ways that are good for our family, good for the farmers' families. Um, again, I invite you to learn a whole lot more about what that movement is trying to do to support this entire, the local farmers, the small farmers who have invested families, um, their families for generations are in the land and the land stewardship. And yes, this even goes into issues of social justice. Um, whose land is it? How long has it been in their family? Uh, who, where, who did it belong to before that? But the idea is we can't solve any or any of those problems um, by eating things that just aren't food. So let me talk a little bit about meat substitutes and what I see when I look at the labels. Um, so hold on, let me make sure I think. So we've talked about it's, it needs to be substituted because, yes, meat is important. It is. Um, it needs to be substituted because we think, but meat is also bad. And hopefully I'm beginning to sort of break that myth apart a little bit. Uh, certain kinds of meat, the way that they're raised are bad. Not all meat is raised in this bad way. And if we can do it right and support um, these proper methods and the families that are trying to do it, then we actually have the power and the potential to turn a whole lot of other issues around, not just the issue of um, toxic factory farmed meat. Okay, but now I want to talk about these meat substitutes. They've become popular because, again, this propaganda. They've become popular because we are, unfortunately, really being shifted toward believing that things that are best for a human body can even come out of a box or a bag. I mean, um, there's a whole lot of propaganda around this, just even from the beginning, from mothers being told that what Nestle makes in a can is superior to what their own bodies can make in terms of human breast milk, right? So, so this propaganda, this belief system starts there. And it's really my heart's desire to myth, to just bust all of that, the myth that human beings can make nutrition in a factory, in a laboratory that is somehow superior. It's not. It, it, the human body cannot use synthetic supplements. I just talked about that all last weekend. We cannot um, use plant proteins as well as we use animal proteins. So that's the other thing I want to say. If you're not going to eat real meat, no judgment here, but please, please make sure that you are learning how to combine plant proteins so that you get the entire um, alphabet of essential amino acids. That's really important for your health for your neurotransmitters, for your mood, learning, um, all the stuff in the brain requires those amino acids. We see that vegetarians have much higher rates. The research is really conclusive about this. Vegetarians have much higher rates of depression and mental illness. Um, and this is not likely because they eat vegetables. It's more likely because a lot of modern day vegetarians don't actually eat vegetables. They just don't eat meat and they're eating a whole bunch of other processed packaged crap instead. And so they're missing out on all of this essential nutrition. All right. So if you are not going to eat meat, absolutely fine. Please, if you don't like meat, 
absolutely fine. If meat does not agree with you, absolutely fine. What I teach above everything is pay attention to your body. Pay attention to your instincts. What are you drawn toward? What are you craving? What makes your body feel satisfied? What is your body asking for? How are your moods and your bowel movements and your sleep? How's your movement and your exercise? All of this depends on the nutrition we're putting into our bodies. All of these are feedback tools telling us if we're getting what we need, okay? So I want you to pay attention to that. But if you are morally opposed to meat, then you need to find plant proteins that are going to satisfy your protein requirements, okay? If you are not morally opposed to meat, but you've just sort of begun to wonder, well, maybe they're right, maybe, you know, stuff that comes in a box in a bag, you know, maybe they did engineer it to be nutritionally superior, superior to what God and Mother Nature have been um, conspiring to for all these millennia. Maybe the scientists do know better. If you're kind of there and wondering if you can get your supplements out of a bottle and get your meat out of, you know, a fake um, plastic package, I want to stop you. I want to ask you to read the ingredients. Now, if you're not sure about what you're seeing on the ingredient labels, what it really means, if it's real food, if it's something your body can and should be trying to digest, then I want you to reach out to me. I just did a label reading workshop last weekend. That recording is available to folks who want or need it. You just have to request that from me. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel in this moment. I will just uh, get you that recording so that you can take the time to walk through that presentation with me. It's a whole workshop that teaches you what, um, what you're seeing on the labels, what it is, and then if you should be eating it, what it does inside your body, okay? So reach out and get that from me. Um, because here's the deal. When you look at that package of Beyond Meat, you're going to see um, some of the no-nos that I talk about in that label reading workshop. You're going to see proteins that are hydrolyzed, that are concentrates, um, and you're going to see a whole bunch of plant proteins that are out of the context that nature intended them. So here's the thing. The first ingredient in a lot of that stuff is something like a pea protein. They take some kind of a plant protein that's somewhat concentrated, and then they even hyper-concentrate it. Um, it's usually powdered. Yeah, see, and then to get the texture, something that's going to be like a meat-like texture, then they've got to add a whole bunch of other, you know, strange and processed ingredients, fillers, um, and I mean, heck, sometimes even flour, it can have flour, it can have gluten in there. Um, if you're celiac, celiac like I am, or possibly gluten sensitive, which is about a third of us now, um, you know, that's going to be a red flag. That's definitely going to be worse for you than just eating a steak. So read your ingredients list. What they do when they concentrate those plant proteins is they split them into molecular forms that are very difficult for the body to recognize, use, and assimilate. In other words, none of that may actually be usable protein to the body. Um, the research that they do in a lab is a totally different situation than what happens when you consume that food by your human body and then observe how the human body is handling it. And that's the kind of research that I'm inviting you to. So I want, I, first of all, please don't eat uh, meat substitutes. <laughs> if you do, if they feel important to you for whatever reason, then read the ingredients list. Get the most natural foods you can find always. Do not eat hydrolyzed or protein concentrates or um, any molecularly assembled protein substitutes. Um, and do not eat foods that are packed full of texturizers, gums, stabilizers. This is all artificial stuff that's just made to give food a look and a feel and a texture that is something that you like. And so here's what I recommend instead. Either find good sources of real meat and eat real unprocessed meat, or don't eat meat and go find real sources of other foods. Top of the list should be a rainbow color of all natural, fresh, in-season vegetables. Um, go ahead then and combine your plant proteins, but don't do it with hydrolyzed pea protein concentrate. Eat peas. <laughs> don't do it with, um, you know, all of these, these sort of fake synthetic uh, bioengineered food 
um, molecules, just do it with food. Just go out and find the best, most nutritious, um, most colorful, most fresh food you can find and learn a little bit about um, uh, plant protein complements and, and get yourself set up with a really healthy vegetarian diet then that's full of vegetables. Okay, a lot of vegetarians that I meet don't even really eat vegetables. So stop that. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's what I really have to say about that. And I just want to say for a lot of you uh, who I meet and who, who have the courage to reach out and ask me these questions, I know some people are thinking like, I want to ask Darcy about this. I wonder what she's going to say. Well, I'm always going to give you, um, you know, the truth as I know it, the truth as I understand it. And I'm always going to do my very best to help us just sort of keep unraveling this, this ball of, of misinformation and propaganda that has been intentionally woven to benefit someone's margins, profit margins, their bottom line, and not your health. All right? So read the ingredients list. Oh, here's what I want you to learn then. Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf, Google them. They wrote a book called Sacred Cow. I highly recommend it. Both of them and their individual work is really important in terms of understanding the importance of regeneratively farmed meat, um, sustainably farmed meat, what that does for the body, for the farm, for the planet, for the farmer. Um, so I want you to read their book, Sacred Cow, or watch the documentary Sacred Cow. There was another one called, I believe it's called Kiss the Ground. Um, narrated by Woody Harrelson that helps to explain why regeneratively farmed uh, animal products are an important part of human health and the ecosystems that we are desperately trying to undo what we've done to unbalance them, right? So we need to be a part of these solutions and we just need to become better informed. So eliminating um, animal protein is not necessarily the way to go. So I just wanted to lay that out there. So go find those resources. Continue to learn a little bit more about that. If you want to eat meat, so here's the thing, the other thing that I really kind of have to push people on sometimes. Sometimes they their mind doesn't want to eat meat because they have learned about the cruelty in the factory farming industry, which is true. Don't buy factory farmed meat. Um, go meet a farmer, buy your meat from the farmer, um, you'd be amazed at how some of these people feel and the stories that they tell and the sacred the, the sacred responsibility they feel it is when they take a, a small handful of their animals to processing um, and that that is a part of, of this whole journey and what they're doing on the planet. And, you know, here's the other thing. We can probably eat less meat. We can also probably eat more of that animal. Think about the parts that we eat and what happens to the rest of it and how outside of, of our true spiritual understanding and wisdom that behavior is, right? What we learned from native populations is that that entire animal was meant to be worshipped, that our lives depend on it and that we don't just cut it apart and take the, the best steaks and fry them and leave the rest to, to rot in the field. I mean, that's what, that's what white colonizers did. That is not how native people treated the land and the animals that were a part of it. And we can get back to those more sensible, more humane practices at any moment. Um, I do it with the way I feed my dog. I buy other parts of those animals that are unsellable for human consumption. And that helps to bolster the farmer's um, profits because I'm paying for things that, that would have just been waste. And I can use more of that animal. That feels like a sacred responsibility to me if I'm going to use that animal's body to nourish myself. What other parts of that animal's body can I use for good? So I can get, for example, the pork and beef livers, um, especially if they're pastured. I grind them myself. I feed them to my dog. She eats raw. If I don't eat anything that comes out of a box or a bag, why would I do that for my my beloved dog. So I'm just saying like there are wonderful, really interesting avenues to go down as we begin to explore this. And when we really begin to ask the questions under the questions about this whole uh, meat topic and the need for meat substitutes.
All right, so I hope I have done that some justice. I know that was a while. Um, the feedback I'm always getting is thank you for the answers to the questions and did that really have to be so long? And I tell you, I'm working on it, uh, I'm working on it. So <clears throat> let me get to the other two questions that felt important today. One of them is related to this, I believe, because um, this person was has been experiencing some purges in regards to their elimination and want to know if, you know, having, you know, um, different kind of stools is normal. Um, I happen to know this person has just recently transitioned to a low carb diet. And what's typically what typically happens for people who move to a lower carb diet, at least temporarily to see how their body responds, to lower levels of insulin and higher levels of more nutrient dense food. Because what happens when we're eating a high carb diet is we're eating a lot of things like bread and pasta and all that processed stuff that's really not lots of different foods. It's really just one or two foods. It's wheat flour and sugar. And so it's a, an important part of the foundation of my program is starting with nutrition. And most folks need to do sort of a carb test. So when you do that and you're eating a lower level of carb to begin with or for the first time in a long time, um, what tends to happen actually is the opposite of loose stool. Most people tend to get a little bit firmer or slower or sluggish in their bowels. And that's simply because there's um, up front, it looks like there's less fiber. We usually have to add in fiber in the form of vegetables. There's plenty of other places besides grains to get your fiber and to get plenty of it. Um, and that usually will restore a whole bunch of balance to the stools. In fact, it usually creates much better balance in the stools because it balances the microbiome with all the nutrition that's needed there. And it will eliminate any of the sort of irritable bowel stuff that most people, by the time they're willing to try a carb test with me, they're borderline um, celiac, IBS, uh, pre-diabetic. You know, so these are folks that have metabolic disease. They're right on the doorstep of metabolic disease. So what we typically see then is an improvement in stools because it's all of those refined grain products that are causing uh, the problem to begin with. So I just want you to begin to pay attention to what you're eating and how it's coming out, okay? And if you wanna know more about healthy elimination, what that looks like, what that should feel like, then I want you to go um, take a look at my other, I just did a Q&A a week or two ago about elimination. So you can find that on my YouTube channel where they're all in a nice happy little row and find the Q&A on elimination and learn more there. Okay, but if you notice that you have changed your diet for the better, and you feel like you're getting healthier, and most of the biomarkers in your body are improvements, so your mood, your sleep, your memory, your waist size, um, your bloating, you know, your pain, all of these things, all these biomarkers then are getting better and better and better, but you're having some issues with um, occasional purgy feeling bowel movements, then I want you to actually consider what's purging. It's way more likely that that is something that you just ate and that's more of an acute, immediate reaction. That's far more likely than to say like, oh, I've got toxins stored up from my 30 years of eating bad and they're just now coming out. Probably not. They've been coming out the whole time. <laughs> the body is far more efficient um, at detoxing than we give it credit for. Most of us don't really need a detox. We just need to start eating well. The body is detoxing all the time. And it's usually done without very much drama. So if you do have something like a once in a while loose stool, if it's especially smelly or mucusy, um, if it has a different texture, color, um, consistency, then I want you to ask yourself what you ate, not 30 years ago or a decade ago, or, but within the last three days, okay? Chances are that is something that is um, a sign from your body of how it is processing what just went in within three days. It takes three to four days total for a food to really clear our system. Um, there are lots of, of pathways that foods are gonna clear our system. You know, one is the, the major digestion elimination pathway. You know, they say to, if you wanna know how long it takes um, for your digestion to work, eat beets, right? Because they're red and you can notice. So when did I eat them and when did I pass them? That's a simple way to do it to help you to, you to know. But there are other pathways as well. For example, if I'm gonna eat something really allergenic like corn for me, uh, my knuckles will hurt on the second and third day. So that's another, that's just another pathway. 
the way I digest it, the way my bowels uh, eliminate the, the fiber, the insoluble fiber and the waste of it, that's one thing. But how my body is processing, you know, uh, the, anti the proteins and the antigens and so all of that stuff, um, there's other pathways. That's why a huge part of my program is just teaching people how to tune in and pay attention to their bodies so that you can really know what's bothering you and what's not. And if it does bother you, um, yeah, what well, you might want to be doing about that. So I don't eat corn anymore, right? Because it bothers my knuckles. It doesn't bother my... So the inflammation, it just sort of depends on what's your weakest link. And that's both genetic and personal. And then how is that food being eliminated um, through your body? And is it causing inflammation? And where is that going to show up? So yes, there could be a lot of inflammation in our in our bowel habits, that's one of the easiest places to see if food works for us or not, but it's not the only one. And I just wouldn't get too worried about like, oh, I'm just still getting healthy and so maybe I'm purging. I would literally ask yourself, what did you eat in the last three days? And um, see if you're making a connection because what happens is oftentimes when we're cleaning up our diet, we're taking out the things we know we have a problem with and things get better all of a sudden, but we might then be eating some other things that we could unknowingly have a problem with that it just didn't show up before because other things were a bigger problem or we weren't eating as much of them before. That happened to me when I did my first carb test. I started eating a lot of nuts and it turns out I'm allergic to nuts, but I didn't know that because I didn't eat nuts often enough to have any significant reaction to them until I had given up a bunch of other things. And so, so this is part of a journey. Um, that you're taking with your body. And it's really important that for a lot of us, when we're making changes like this, we keep a journal and we write down um, what we eat and, and on what day and kind of just everyday check in and ask what your symptoms are. I would start with neurological symptoms. So how's my, my brain, my memory, my mood. Um, and then you can move down into your body symptoms and you know, how's my energy, how's my digestion, how, how are my joints and my pain? Um, do I feel um, you know, joy and movement, or is it difficult? And so then you can just begin to sort of tune in from there. And, uh, so that's what I recommend for that. The last question I'm going to address in detail today is muscle cramps. This is also a really important topic to discuss when we're looking at lower carb diets, because for a lot of us who have been eating higher carbs, well, let's see, I'm um, trying to think about um, how I want to explain this pathway. The simplest answer here is that cramps, so this person has leg cramps. I get, occasionally get leg cramps, and can you explain what's happening in my body? Well, maybe. I think that it's one of two things. Um, this is what we typically see. Leg cramps, whether they be later in the day or whether they be related to after exercise, and sometimes those are leg cramps. Sometimes people will get them abdominal cramps or like, a, you know, we call it a stitch, like in your side. Those kind of muscle cramps typically are related to hydration. And hydration might or might not be that you're not getting enough fluid or water. It might be your electrolyte balance, right? Because electrolytes are what, those are the minerals that allow the fluids to get across the cell membrane and actually into the cells. So what happens when we are on keto or a low carb diet all of a sudden, that really changes um, the mineralization of the body. And it, it actually doesn't, like we probably always needed um, better minerals, um, better electrolytes. And most of us, most of us are pretty low in our electrolytes, especially potassium. So it's almost impossible to get enough potassium these days. So the idea is we all probably should be supplementing with some electrolytes. When you go keto or low carb, that becomes especially important to be more religious about it. You're going to notice. So what I recommend is that we don't do Gatorade. Take a look at the label there. You know I'm not going to approve any of that stuff, the colors, the sugars, all the junk in there. But it's really easy now because there are several companies that are selling all natural electrolytes. You can get them in a health food store. Um, I'm happy. If you reach out to me, I'm happy to share the brand that I'm, I'm really digging these days. Um, sweetened with a little bit of stevia, which I don't mind. And other than that, it's just all of the electrolytes, the minerals you need, and none of the junk. So I would say for cramps, 
Definitely make sure that you're hydrated enough. Make sure that you are getting your electrolytes. That's part of proper hydration. Make sure that your movement, um, this can also be related to hormones depending on your, for women, your age and where you are with your um, fertility cycle. It can have a lot to do with our hormone balance. So one of the things I really recommend is that we just begin to, again, observe and notice if there is any pattern to this. For some of us, we're going to have to move our exercise to earlier in the day so that, um, yeah, so that the cramps don't get to us at night when we're trying to sleep. And oftentimes, keeping to a regular exercise routine is going to help with the neurological part of that restless leg stuff that can happen for us in the evenings as well. So again, observe, make sure you're getting hydrated, hydration with your electrolytes, keep a journal, pay attention to when your hormones are sort of on or offline, and um, see if you can just begin to put together the pattern with those leg cramps, okay? But definitely start with the electrolytes. All right, and then the last question, which I'm only gonna touch on and we're gonna have to pick up next week. I get this question or a question like it uh, of this theme every week. This particular one, I really wanted to pull apart. And so listen, Darcy, I've read that mushrooms are really good for A1C. I'm pre-diabetic and I'm wondering if I should start taking some of these mushrooms, mushroom powder, mushroom pills um, to improve my A1C. All right. So first of all, I just want to point out how symptomatic that kind of thinking is. So I have this problem. Should I take this pill? And what's the difference if it's a mushroom pill or if it's a pill from the pharmacy or where you got the pill? Like if it's this thing that's bothering me, um, should I just take something for it? All right. So I want us to really just we, we need to unravel that kind of thinking. So here's the here's the way I want you to begin thinking about this. And I'm going to let you simmer on this until next week. It makes sense then if we're going to think about root causes and that's what i really want you thinking about root causes it makes sense then that if a lack of enough mushrooms or whatever kind of nutrition mushrooms have in them if it's a lack of those mushrooms that caused your a1c numbers then taking those mushrooms would fix it right but what you have to really ask yourself is is that addressing the root cause and I'll say there might be, in fact, there are. There's wonderful health benefits to mushrooms because they're a very nutrient dense food, because they have some unique nutritional properties that can't easily be gotten from other foods. So when we eat enough mushrooms, we are definitely impacting our nutrition in these positive ways because of the things that they bring into the body, that the body uses well and needs and likes, okay? But let's be careful that we're saying, oh, wait, I'm going to eat some really hyper uh, nutrient dense food to solve a problem. Are those related? Do you know what your A1C numbers even mean? A1C is a long term measurement of how well you are able to control your glucose. In other words, it's a measurement over time of how steady is your blood sugar mechanism. And what impacts your blood sugar mechanism? Well, the foods that you eat, particularly sugar and refined processed carbohydrate dense foods. All right. So that's the cause of your A1C. So it's not going to make much sense if eating Pop-Tarts for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch and pizza for dinner, if that's how you're eating and your A1C is high, does it make sense you can just add in some mushrooms and the A1C will change? Does that make sense? Does it make sense that we can keep eating Pop-Tarts, which causes the blood sugar instability, and add mushrooms? Does that make sense? It really doesn't, does it? So what we're going to have to do is begin to look at this from a root cause perspective. We're going to have to understand what causes the blood sugar instability, what those A1C numbers mean, and then how we are going to reverse them. And I have all the answers for that next week. Same time, same place. Come and find me. We'll talk more about this in depth. And then we'll talk about also 
I'm not dissing on the mushrooms. I think they're really important and you'll learn more next week. So for now, beloveds, please only eat real food. Go learn about regenerative agriculture um, and the meat that comes from those kind of farms. Make sure to take your electrolytes, get outside and go for a beautiful walk. Rest well, love that one beautiful human body you have. And I'll see you next time. Be well, everybody.